All right. Um, I think I'm, I'm of course ready. So let me know if you guys can hear me. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. We're good. Yep. Cool. Okay. So um, thank you very much for joining today. I'll be discussing today, uh, basically giving you a glimpse of like two D materials and how we can grow these materials and how we can utilize these two dimensional materials and. Uh, using some of our facilities here at Tech, Tech 2 and also Speed. And so uh, I'll be talking a little bit about F XPS uh, and then SIMS, how we can utilize these two instruments uh, potentially for all these low dimensional materials. Um, it can be 2D and I'll be talking a little bit about Raman in the last part of the talk uh, where we can, we have used those uh, for the, of course, because it is one of the essential tool uh, for if, when you talk about low dimensional materials and I'll, I'll discuss why so before I jump into the talk, I'll just give you an outline what I'll be discussing today. So firstly, I will give you a little bit of intro of 2D materials. I believe there are people who knows it, but somehow uh, I just thought maybe it's better to just give you an idea of what are these 2D materials and how, why they are so important in these days and uh, in the current arena and also how we can utilize to uh, synthesize them. Um, there are different approaches um, to grow them at a large scale and also for the small scale. Uh, and then, of course, uh, why uh, these characterizations are so important because, of course, we've been talking about uh, very thin materials. So uh, it, it has become a very important perspective, basically, to know. To know, I mean, what which characterization tools you can use. Um, so I'll be discussing about DOFSIMS and then XPS later down the road, and uh, uh, and then, of course, I mean, some of the advanced material characterization techniques using XPS and UPS. Um, and then lastly, uh, I'll be discussing a little bit about ramen. And of course, we do have like polarized ramen techniques. And then um, recently, we'll be getting a new setup of TERS. So I'll, I'll be giving a little bit glimpse of that, that technique as well. Um, so just an overview of these 2D materials, as I said in the, in the previously. So uh, they have become basically, when you talk about 2D materials, uh, this the whole storyline started right after the discovery of graphene, which is a single layer, a monolayer of um, of carbon. So uh, people at, uh, I would say, uh, Philip Kim, he was trying to grow this, I would not say grow it, but he was trying to uh, peel off the different layers of carbon uh, by using cantilever or AFM. And now he's working at Harvard. He was the one who was basically working on it. And then after that, Andrew Geim and um, Novus Love in 2005, they came up with a very interesting technique of basically scotch tape. They just simply can use a scotch tape to peel off different layers. And that's where they have discovered this monolayer or a few layers of graphene. And more, more interestingly, of course, because it, uh, it got a Nobel Prize in 2009 in physics. And the reason behind it is because, um, of course, because of the very interesting electronic properties of this, these materials. And right after that, you can see there's a timeline which, which basically have shown us, like, I mean, how these 2D materials have basically advanced. You can see silicon, of course, because whole silicon industry, I mean, all this, all of our semiconductor industry love to have silicon. So they wanted to have like um, a, a, a material which can actually give us like literally a lot of mobility. When I say mobility is more about how fast an electron can move um, on, a, on a surface. And then later down the road, you can see in 2014, 16 and 18, literally there's a whole bunch of new materials which have been discovered. And the reason behind it, of course, because you wanted to have like all these beautiful uh, properties of these materials, which graphene has given us not only efficiency, but also uh, it was thin, it can be tunable, it can be changed. That means you can change the properties of the materials. One of the concerns we had in graphene was because it has metallic nature and all the semiconductor industry wants to have semiconductor properties of a material. And that's why a lot of work has been done uh, to advance in this arena. In this specific way, like for example, like literally from 1960s, like uh, there is another other part of the 2D material, which is TMDs, like transition metal calcogenides. So where you add one transition metal to all these calcogen atoms, uh, which is carbon or even all this uh, sulfur, selenium, tellurium, and also these also. That, so you can add these two materials to it, and then you can all make this 2MD materials. So since 1986, uh, 1960, it's almost 88, I would say even more than that now, uh, have been people and materials have been discovered since now. Uh, and people have been trying to discover not only see that, but also trying to 
uh, uh, see their properties and try to see, for example, if how we can utilize them in different different applications. I'm not going to go into the application part, but uh, just to give you an idea, like I mean, for example, here these are some of the examples of all these 2D materials which has been discovered so far. These are some of the new materials, borophene and galilene. Of course, uh, we know um, even in Northwestern people have been known for borophene uh, discovery, and then of course. Because I said, I mean, because people like to uh, do all these semiconductor properties of so germanine and also uh, silicine was one of the major um, perspective in this perspective in this case. So, uh, and then of course here there are a lot of them uh, which has been discovered so far. Um, so talking about the synthesis of these two D materials, most more or less, of course, you would like to have a large area crystal growth. Um, uh, uh, because of course, with the research perspective, you can actually do exfoliation, but exfoliation can only give you few layers, or it would say few microns of layers. But when you want to grow it at a large scale, of course, people have used the chemical vapor deposition, um, which I'm not going to go into detail, but of course, that's uh, basically a scheme here. Uh, you basically use a precursor to pick up one of the um, uh, diffusion atoms, for example, in this case, it's sulfur, and then you can basically use an, any, any sort of oxide. Which can be used as a metal, uh, and then uh, you can actually grow these crystals. Like for example, in, in this case, molysulfide, molydisulfide, um, and and more recently, people have been working on uh, metal organic CBD, where uh, you can actually use all these precursors because these are paraphoric precursors. So you that you need to be extra cautious. You need to be having a, a specific uh, system for that, a scrubber before you expose it to the air. That's why uh, most of the industry has been using it in the research perspective. I mean, we have not used it. You need to have a ultra high vacuum to control this. That's why most of the uh, people have been advancing their MBE setups to the MOCVD setups. So in here, you can see here, I mean, you can actually uh, use all these metal and also uh, not only calcogen precursors, which can be used as a within inert gas or maybe a carrier gas to grow all these uh, two dimensional materials. This is more, more recent advancement in this uh, uh, synthesis per perspective of 2D material. So one of the concern, I mean, as I said, I mean, because these 2D materials have a dimensionalities perspective, I mean, it's just 2D. It does not have a third dimension. That's why when you're talking about 2D, they are literally very thin layers of materials sitting on, on a substrate. So in order to uh, look into some of the characteristics or some of the imp important properties of these materials. Either you have to go to uh, very uh, efficient, of course, I, I would say atomic scale resolution, HRTM, or some of the other techniques which I'll be discussing here. That's why it is very important that you have, you need to have um, an efficient route to characterize these materials. Uh, for example, the, here is an example I'm, I just added here. For example, in the case of like, this is an, um, an MS2 graph where uh, you do you do see like it's a monolayer of uh, of uh, of a material, but problem is of course when you're going to we're going to look into the elemental analysis for example using EDS I mean you won't be able to look into it because the penetration depth for the EDS is is almost a micron or of course if you can play around if you can tune it you can actually change it, but still I mean this is how you you might not be able to get like a, a very fine feature so. So basically, material like uh, I would say characterization tools like Raman and also I will talk about SAMS would become very essential and very important to, to look into these 2D materials. That's why I will be focusing and starting my talk with the, the SAMS analysis. So for example, here you can see like how uh, scanty electron, a uh, secondary ion mass spectroscopy can be used to do this elemental analysis because of the sensitivity of these materials. So because the SEMS can actually, the penetration depth is almost few nanometers. And, and that's the reason actually you can, it, it is very much surface dependent and utilizing the SEMS you can actually see, or you can do the elemental analysis of these 2D materials. For example, here are some of the examples that I've actually chosen from another paper, which talks about um, literally copper, uh, graphene growth on directly on copper. And, and, and you can see even directly on copper, you can see uh, you can distinguish between two elements, which is uh, carbon in this perspective, and then uh, you have car uh, copper. You clearly just, uh, can see these hexag hexagonal structures of the, the carbon sitting on a copper foil. Um, and then um, not only that, but you transfer this graphene on a silicon oxide. Uh, so what the idea is basically, even if you are a metallic surface or even in, a, in a, any of the dielectric surface, you can still pick up very easily all these materials. Uh, Inset actually showing a ramen which basically confirms I'll talk about it in a bit. Uh, 
Um, so not only that, I mean, we, this is a very simple analysis, but I mean, uh, this is uh, what you can actually look into. This is not only like sims can be used to just look into the elemental analysis, but also it can, the intensity of the peak, if you look very carefully, you can actually distinguish different layers on the surface. So for example, in this particular example, uh, when you have growing, when you are growing the surface of uh, graphene on the surface of copper, um, so without any growth, you will see just a carbon, a copper signal uh, on the first layer. But then on the second layer, um, my apologies. So basically, this is carbon which is covered on the whole surface. And then when you have a second layer on top of the the first layer, which is after some time of the growth, you can distinguish. Like I mean, the intensity of the peak will be enhanced, which basically means that it has more carbon on that specific area. And similarly for the trilayer. So basically, what I'm trying to explain here is like literally by changing, uh, by looking at the intensity of different ion maps of the carbon, you can actually distinguish different thicknesses of the of the layers of a 2D layer. For example, in this particular example, um, you can see uh, literally layers of like monolayer and then going to above like more than six layers. And you can literally distinguish that. So here's an optical image where, is it, where the right hand side is showing a map, which confirms the thickness of uh, of uh, of a layer, uh, which I mean, corresponds to almost more than I would say few tens of nanometer of layers on, on top of the uh, of this layer. So I mean, I'm just trying to push in here. I mean, this sense can be utilized to to use um, not only for the elemental analysis, but also you can do like structural analysis, not on the surface, but also you can distinguish different thicknesses of the layers uh, sitting on top of any of the substrate. Um, and we're giving an, under, like an understanding because it's not only for the case of graphene, it is, it can be utilized for any other materials. For example, in this case, like I'm giving you a versatility of this elemental mapping. So you can utilize this concept in on any other 2D materials. We have used it for MOS2, WS2, and in, here in, in the top hand side, you can see for hydrogenyl boronitride. Uh, you can clearly see those um, boron signal coming from B plus signals, basically coming from this uh, whole area, uh, which is grown on copper. Uh, and then on the right hand side, you can see because which, which I have discussed in the previous slide, like you can you can utilize this concept uh, for even for uh, thickness monitoring as well. Um, and, and the bottom side is basically giving you an, an idea of the tungsten disulfide growth on the silicon oxide. Um, and one other perspective, which is very important, is heterostructures. I've seen a question which uh, somebody has asked uh, uh, about the heterostructures analysis on this on these materials. So I think it is uh, very important that these sensors can actually be ut utilized for for looking into some of the heterostructure because a lot of work has been done. As I said in the start of the introduction, like graphene has a metallic nature. So of course, in order to induce some semiconductor nature or characteristics in these materials people have trying to make some heterostructures out of, of, of it. And then one of the example is in the, on the left-hand side where you can see like MOS2 layer sitting on a graphene layer. Uh, but of course, looking at the optical contrast, you can distinguish it. But I mean, if you want to see, for example, in, in the Raman mode, you can definitely distinguish both. Like if there's a presence of MOS2 on this and then the graphene, um, I'm, I'm going to talk about these peaks in, in a bit. Uh, and then two different PL, uh, which can actually, you can basically see like an MS2 layer and an interface of MS2, the PL was being different. Um, so in here, here with the SIMS map, I mean, you can see um, right at the growth, like first, first of all, you have a graphene, it can be picked up. But once you increase the map analysis, I mean, you can distinguish uh, an MOS2 and a graphene right on top of each other. So basically you have to do the SIMS analysis for a longer time in order to determine the elemental, different elemental compositions on the surface. Um, and similarly, this is another perspective where you can do the thickness mapping via depth profile. So basically you etch the surface because we do have a, a, a basically a technique which can, can actually use utilize this um, as a sputterer to basically etch the surface, um, spread those ions on the surface and in order to just etch the surface. And uh, it, here the right hand side basically showing like, I mean, you can literally etch this, um, for example, 2D layer. And, and based on that etching, you can actually distinguish like what is the thickness, the exact thickness of the layer surface. So for example, here uh, you can see like, I mean, the, the top, top right, most of the thickness is basically almost like a few tens of nanometers. And then going to the bottom surface, of course, you will have uh, thinner layers of carbon, uh, which, which and, and here is an example where they've actually calculated the experimental and theoretical values, which are very much, um, I would say more, uh, uh, 
related to what you have uh, discussed in the theoretical values. So uh, just adding, I mean, the thickness mapping can be done on by, by top-down approach and also bottom approach. Um, so, I mean, just adding here, like we'll be having a uh, top sims, uh, M3, DM3, they call it. I mean, and uh, we'll be having this installed in our CAC2 facilities pretty recently, and uh, I believe in a month or so. And uh, if you have any more questions, you can ask uh, Sinchi about it. Uh, but this could be a very nice tool. We will be having a silicon source, which can be used to iron source, which can be used to do all the elemental analysis. Of course, the, the lateral resolution is really nice. I mean, uh, we can actually go to a few, few tens of nanometers. Um, and then, of course, the mass resolution is also to 3,000. If you have any other more questions, you can definitely ask us. And uh, I, I hope this could be a really good uh, addition to our facility. Um, with that, I'm going to jump into the second part where I'll be discussing a little bit about UPS and XPS. Um, just an overview of XPS, how does it work? I hope I, most of the people know, like, I mean, but usually you use um, uh, XPS because of the higher energy of the X-rays. I mean, you can actually uh, look at the binding energy of the crystals uh, by just looking into the core electrons coming from a K-shell. But uh, for example, in the case of UV, because it's a, it's a low energy perspective, then you can actually just uh, take out some, eject some of the uh, electrons from the valence shell, which can actually be used to to understand some of the uh, some of the electronic structure of the material, and and uh, the X rays or XPS can be used in the elemental composition analysis of the of the material perspective. So the right hand side basically showing a, a, just a schematic of uh, how we can actually uh, the, basically the, the working principle of both the both the XPS and the UPS. Um, just an analysis, just an overview of the UPS, because because as I said on the previous slide, that I mean you can use or utilize this uh, UPS perspective to understand or, or give you an idea of uh, um, an electrical electrical uh, band structure of the material. I uh, would more perspective, more specifically, say work function of the material. So, for example, in in the case of this is a left hand side is showing an example of a metallic surf surface where we can actually utilize this and expose it to the the, the ultraviolet light, which basically uh, eject the electrons from the valence shell, and uh, once you have that uh, going from the, the valence shell and going to the from the Fermi level, because in the metal case the Fermi level lies right on the edge of the surface, so it can go to the vacuum, and then by subtracting this value, because we know the HV value of our incident light, which is 21.2 eV, so you can subtract this value. For example, in this case is 15.9. So when you can subtract, you can actually calculate the work function. Uh, and it can actually, this, this uh, specific um, uh, technique can be very helpful or can be crucial to understand the electronic structure of a system. Um, so giving a few examples like which we have done in the metal, uh, some of the material systems which have we have uh, done uh, very recently, for example, in this case, this is an XPS and UPS analysis on some of the calcophosphates, um, which person mercury from the chemistry department has been utilizing. And uh, we, uh, we have looked into not only the elemental structure, but also uh, the electrical structure. Similarly, the same same technique has been utilized in the case of manganese, uh, cobalt, phosphor, uh, calcophosphates. Um, the, you can clearly see here. I mean, you can utilize the, the shift in the peaks can actually confirm the incorporation of one of the uh, manganese uh, cobalt into the manganese system. Um, so uh, basically, giving a few more examples in here, uh, like for example, in the case of two D materials. Uh, of course, this is also a two D. These are also two D materials, but we have done this uh, in, in a in, in a bulk form, uh, but in this case, for example, you can actually utilize these 2D materials sitting on the surface. For example, in this perspective, in this particular case, um, not only uh, on a single substrate, you can actually use, use uh, XPS to distinguish in the different substrates. For example, in, in this case, we have grown some copper sulfide, copper disulfide, and then copper sulfide, and then uh, copper selenide, and also copper telluride. And, and you can see on tungsten, you can clearly um, pick up copper and selenium peaks. Um, uh, and then, Similarly, for the case of copper tellurium, uh, you can look into the elemental analysis, so you can definitely pick up copper and also tellurium. Not only a copper surface, but also on the sapphire in here. So just to, just to give an idea, like it is, it is the, the the technique is almost coffee as a lot of robust, and can be you know, picked up any other stuff. So um, other than that, we have uh, of course a very interesting te technique of depth profiling, uh, which can be used for two D materials as well. So here's an example where basically the, the working principle of the, the profiling, we do have argon uh, ions, which can be used to etch to the surface. Of course you can, um, because it, this varies from different materials to materials. For example, if you are using a lighter material, it can actually faster 
So it's, um, it is recommended that you can actually um, do <clears throat> your analysis first on your on your substrates and then maybe replicate it in other, other substrates. Uh, for example, in, in this particular example, we have used copper tellurite, and, and you can see right in the start of the, of the analysis, you can see a tellurium oxide peak right in this in here, but when you uh, etch it for 30 seconds, just and then you can uh, clean away the surface from the oxide and you can start seeing the copper tellurium, the tellurite um, peaks uh, coming from the, uh, the 2D layer. Um, with that, uh, there is an example here, which basically confirmed, this is from the literature, which confirmed like how uh, to, this depth profiling can be used to see elemental analysis or layered structures. This is not for a particular example for the 2D structure, but I mean, 3D layers, like for example, here in this particular example, silicon will have a silicon oxide layer. <clears throat> um, uh, and then uh, basically you, you can even distinguish the interface between one layer to another. So here, if you can see a very um, in-depth in, in analysis here, which uh, can confirm that you can see a change or not even a transition coming from a titanium to silicon. Um, and there is a shift which basically can confirms the silicon and titanium oxide presence on, on this perspective. And, um, and similarly for the titanium, I mean, you can see, uh, you, you can actually uh, basically clean off all the titanium from the surface. Um, with that, I'll be looking into a little bit of the Raman perspective. I mean, Raman has become a very essential tool on, in all these 2D materials because uh, it is giving giving you a for non vibration modes of different 2D materials. But this has been started um, from Ferrari's work uh, right at 2000. Um, and uh, before even the discovery of graphene, he basically discovered like these for non vibrations on a particular um, modes can be utilized to determine different thicknesses of a material. So the, this L, as you basically, you can see um, this E2G mode, which is very famous in the graphene community is basically the, and then the D mode, which is called the brilling mode uh, on the surface. It is, brilling mode is suppressed in the monolayer, but when you add something on the surface, it can be utilized, it become active. So that's why, I mean, D mode can be utilized to see any defects on the surface. Not only that, but also the ratio between two, these two modes can be utilized to determine the thickness of these materials. So here, for example, this is an example where, uh, as I mentioned, because the, in the, in the monolayer or the pristine 2D layer, you don't see a deep peak, but then right after you can, you can add something or basically in this perspective, you can go to an edge of the graphene, you start seeing a deep peak because of course, having a defect on the surface. So similarly, um, a lot of that, a, people, a lot of work has been done in, into in, in determining different prospect or different perspective of the, of the Raman signals on these, uh, 2D structures, for example, in the case of graphene, as SP, SP2 bonding states of, of graphene in the morphous case, and then crystalline case, and then um, graphene single wall carbon nanotubes. tubes. Um, similarly, if you induce, I mean, there's a lot of work which has been done uh, with, where people have studied how Raman can be utilized to see different, uh, I would say, strain on the surface. Um, like, for example, in these two modes, like, and you can see if you add more strain onto the, onto the layer, uh, you you can distinguish like a G mode can actually um, has a doublet which can basically use more and more strain which can basically used as a characteristic mode for understanding the stress on the surface of the graphene. Um, similarly, uh, as I said, like thickness dependence. I mean, you, it is also pretty known. Like, I mean, you can determine the ratios between these two modes to determine different thicknesses of particular in this case it is graphene. Um, um, and, and then there was one more ex ex example. Like, I mean, you can literally see the graphene 2D peak to determine different stacking of the surface. For example, in this case, particular case, like we, you do have AV stacking but of, a, of a three layer graphene, but then ABC stacking can actually give you a doublet on the right hand side and, and it can increase if you increase the layer uh, layers of these stacking. So for example, AV, AV for four layer and then ABC for four layers, it basically just, it's different uh, to, each other. So one of the questions was also something particular to this one, like how we can actually look into uh, different layers and, and can we use Raman? Of course you can use, and you can lit literally distinguish the different stacking angles by just looking at the 2D peaks of the, of the graphene. Uh, of course it, diff it differ or is different for the other 2D materials perspective. So in the case of examples of Raman, I mean, of course we have used this calcophosphate and also uh, copper tellurite, which we, uh, we have, dis have, have discussed previously. So in the in the same case, which we have discussed in the case of graphene, I mean, you can utilize uh, these 2D peaks, or I would say uh, these peaks to determine the thickness of different materials. So for example, in this particular case, we have used uh, copper tellurite 
uh, and these two modes, A1G and ED mode, E1G mode do, and the ratio between two basically can determine the thickness of these uh, materials. Um, uh, and then uh, basically that's a particular rate. And then uh, we, in the last part of the talk, I'll be discussing a little bit about the polarization dependent of the Raman, uh, where basically you can in, in, in basically induce a polarization in the, the Raman and which can be used to determine different uh, angles or I would say different ad, advanced um, in-plane anisotropy in the system. Um, so for example, in this particular example, you can see molycar molycarbide has been uh, used. And when you use polarized Raman, you can determine different uh, preferred phonon vibrations at, in, in a one single hexagonal structure. So for, for example, in this case, there are specific modes of, uh, of Raman which become more active and they have more anisotropy compared to another one. Um, so we have utilized the same concept in one of the example of NIPS where uh, you can see right from the start, like for example, if you, if you look very carefully in these two peaks here, you can see there was just a change when you just simply change the polarizer angle of this material. So which basically confirmed that the system has a, an isotropy. Uh, so we basically have uh, done an analysis where we basically changed the whole uh, angles of these for, uh, of the incident laser, uh, polarizer angle of the incident laser. And we, did, we have determined that there is an isotropy present in these two um, uh, modes of, the, of this material. Um, and then with that, I would like to just add a little bit about the TERS, which is going to be uh, in, in our, added into our facility. Um, the TERS is a technique where we basically can utilize a tip, AFM tip, which can uh, help us to enhance um, the lateral resolution of the material system. So of course, it, uh, here, here is one of the uh, working principle of the material. And then the right of the side is basically showing an example which confirms like, I mean, you can literally see, a, for example, a carbon nanotube, which is almost eight nanometers or so. So TERFs will definitely help us to look into, because right now, Raman, uh, I would say, uh, the, the, one, of the, one of the key issue of the Raman spectrum is basically, uh, we cannot look into the nanometer scale of the, of, the, of the materials. But I mean, looking at the TERFs, I mean, if we can utilize it, then we can easily look into materials, which we are a few nanometers in size. With this, I would like to conclude. Uh, and I'll be really uh, happy to uh, answer any questions if you have.